I got up out of the bed and went down the stairs and I turned to the living room but I see my daddy lying on the floor. His eyes were closed and there was lots of people in the room but I couldn't really see the people in the room I was just looking at my daddy. I felt all this glass coming in all over my face and the loudness of a bang. I looked at my dad and there was just blood everywhere, all this over his whole face, body, and all over me. And um, I was just getting glimpses of him because of the glass. And I was calling his name and I was saying, Daddy, Daddy. I could see, you know, the, the wounds on his body, you know you know, the, the blood and the, the, there was blood splattered just everywhere. He started to fall asleep and I mean, the neighbour had said to me, you know, get a pillow for his head and he was telling him not to go to sleep and, you know, he just, he did, you know, he just lay there. devastated my family to be honest. When I look back on it now I actually uh, consider myself lucky in a way because I was so young when it happened and because I was so young I wasn't actually used to you know have a, as, a, as I grew older and um, I didn't really get to know my mother so you know it didn't affect me as badly as it would have affected uh, my grandparents um, or my stepfather and um, because you know, they actually ha had a chance to get to know my mother, whereas I didn't really. I only knew her, you know, as a kid, and to be honest, I can't really even remember her now, you know. Collusion has been part of the Six County State since its creation. Since then, Successive Unionist governments have relied on its armed militias, the B Specials, the RUC and the Unionist paramilitary death squads to enforce its rule on the people of the North. The 1960s saw a heightened sectarian campaign by Unionist paramilitaries and their political masters aimed at destroying the growing demand for equality and civil rights by the nationalist community. By the time the British state retook control of the six counties after the pogroms of August 1969, collusion was already an established policy, the origins of which can be traced to Brigadier Frank Kitson, who refined and adapted British counterinsurgency policies to suit what he saw as the situation in the North. Kitson said, the law should be used as just another weapon in the government's arsenal and in this case it becomes little more than a propaganda cover for the disposal of unwanted members of the public. There can be no compromise or concession to the enemy that assails our province today. We must build up the dossiers on the men and women who are a menace to this country. Because one day, ladies and gentlemen, if the politicians fail, it may be our job to liquidate the enemy. During the 1970s, some of the most horrific atrocities were carried out by Unionist death squads under the control of British military intelligence. These included no warning car bombs, random sectarian assassinations, many of which were carried out in the most brutal fashion. This murder campaign was deliberately sanctioned and aimed to terrorise the entire nationalist community into relinquishing their demands for an end to partition and for basic civil and human rights. When Margaret Thatcher came to power in 1979, the policy of collusion became a much more controlled and refined weapon in the British government's arsenal in Ireland. Specific mechanisms were established 
to control and direct the Loyalist death squads. The first memory when I heard of her death was disbelief and doubt that it wasn't her. Then when I got to the family home and I'd seen all the people there and it was, it was like an out-of-body experience. You just could not describe it. No police came to our house to inform our family that Philomena was murdered. There was no police liaison officer with our family to tell us what was going on. And that's what struck me, that the police did not inform the family officially. And my father had to go and identify my sister. And my sister had five bullets in the face, one in the chest. And when he went to identify my sister, he fell on top of her and was crying, Philomena, Philomena. And when he came back, the thing that I noticed most about him he had blood on his shirt where he had fallen on top of Philomena because all she had was a sheet from her shoulders down and the blood obviously was seeping through. I was in a neighbour's house next door to my granny's house who minded me when, when my mother was at work and I was, I was just sitting playing away with her and went out and looked out, out her window and just seen cars all over the street but we were told to go back into the living room and then about ten minutes later my daddy came in sat me on his knee and just explained what had happened to mummy. On the day that, that she was killed, I, I was actually making my first communion two weeks later and that, that's all I could say. She's not going to see me in my communion dress. It was just a, a normal day and we just locked up as usual, locked the house up as usual, we, we do every night and went to bed. Um, about quarter past four, Ten past quarter past four in the morning, I heard voices outside the door. So I got up and looked out the bedroom window and I seen an army food patrol. They had been radioing to the registration number of his car. So I got on, just got it back into bed, not thinking anything of it. Within ten minutes, the door was sledged hammer down, and five gunmen came in, run up our stairs, and by that time, Jared had got up got out of bed, he had heard the noise and he seen the gunman coming up the stairs and he shouted it to me, Teresa, it's the orange man. Um, he tried to fight them off down the stairs with a step ladder that we had for to get up into his space. But all I could hear was shots, I seen smoke and flashes and I was trying to protect the kids because I was afraid of them coming into the bedroom. So I threw myself over the kids and Everything seemed to have gone quiet, but you could still smell smoke. And when I went out on the lantern, dirt was lying there, and the blood was everywhere. It actually pumped holes everywhere in his body. I heard this after that um, the fellow who was in the back of the car, John, had taken his hand and he said, um, Are you all right? And um, the fella said, you know, that the blood was just everywhere. It was, you know, that it was a, a terrible, terrible scene. And one of the fellas had actually um, tried to get out of the car and run, and he'd been shot then as he was, you know, getting over a wall on the other side of the road. So um, the, the cops then had been informed, and the ambulance had came, and John was taken to the hospital, and um, then he was pronounced dead. And my parents were informed all of the rest of my family were informed, but I wasn't. I found out that, that he had been killed by the media. I heard his name, name on the radio. That day, you know, with all the security force, you know, activity that was, that was around, there was absolutely no way that anybody could just have come into that area, into, you know, a very strongly Republican nationalist area, and gunned down four people without the help of, of somebody somewhere. Central to the policy of collusion was Brian Nelson. Nelson was a British agent placed inside the UDA. He rose within its ranks and became their top intelligence officer. At this level he controlled all intelligence information used in identifying targets for UDA and other unionist paramilitary death squads. Attempts were made on the lives of at least 
80 people listed in Nelson's target files. 29 were shot dead 